as a researcher at Chesterwood, the historic home, studio, and gardens of Daniel Chester French in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. I've spent many years now thinking about French, his vast number of successful monuments, and American sculpture in general. While French is best known for his iconic figures of the Concord Minuteman and the seated Abraham Lincoln for the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., I think his creative spirit really shines in the more poignant and often more personal allegorical works he created for the nation's cemeteries. These include one of the most important and pivotal works of his long career, the Millmore Memorial, as well as other works that serve as guideposts among his prolific output. I was thrilled to have the opportunity to walk around Forest Hill Cemetery on a Saturday in April and to see some of French's works within the context of the landscape and other memorials. I had only known these memorials through photographs, so it was a real treat to walk around and enjoy the landscape on a beautiful spring day. I've recently become quite fascinated with rural cemeteries, the 19th century answer to overcrowded urban graveyards, which were filled with simple gravestones, often crowded together. At the top are photos from Boston's old granary burial grounds. The grave markers are often decorated with skulls, grim angels, and other imagery evoking terror and the arbitrary nature of death. The gravestones huddle together as if cowering before the wrath of an angry God. In stark contrast are the pleasant rural cemeteries with their meandering paths, vistas, and sheltering trees. I show you a plan for the Albany Rural Cemetery, a bucolic park popular with dog walkers and joggers, not far from where I live in Williamstown, Massachusetts. Two of my other favorites are Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx and Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. At the left is the very ornate Gothic Revival Greenwood Gatehouse uh, designed by Richard Upjohn. It is similar to the gatehouse welcoming visitors to Forest Hill Cemetery designed a few decades earlier by Henry S. Dearborn. The park-like settings of rural cemeteries make you forget the hubbub of the city. It is pleasant to wander the paths and muse about the lives represented by the statues, mausoleums, and memorials. Rural cemeteries are rife with benevolent angels who act as gentle guides to the afterlife, stand sentinel over graves, and record names in the book of life. Equipped with wings that allow them to travel between earth and the world beyond, they offer kind and reassuring messages to grieving family members. As I prepared for this talk, I wondered what exactly makes an effective cemetery memorial? Why can some memorials move a viewer to tears while others ring hollow? What does an accomplished sculpture of monuments, portraits, and public memorials, such as French, bring to the intimate space of a gravesite? And how do these works continue to communicate with us so many years after their commission and installation? I'm not sure I can answer all of these questions today, but I will try to keep them in mind as I continue to think about cemetery monuments and memorials. A quick search around the internet yielded some truly beautiful cemetery statues, such as the two works seen here. On the left, an angel stands watch before a tomb, her arms spread in benevolent gesture. And at right, a graceful figure, um, who is actually, who can be seen at the Forest Hill Cemetery, holds a book inscribed with the words, life made abundant. This is one of my favorites, The Weeping Angel by American sculptor William Wetmore Story in the Protestant Cemetery in Rome. The angel exemplifies the sculptor's great grief in losing his wife, Emmeline. This was Story's last major work prior to his own death, a year after his wife's. The statue's creation was documented in an 1896 issue of Cosmopolitan magazine. According to this account, his wife's death so devastated Story that he lost interest in sculpture but was inspired to create the monument by his children. Unlike the typical angelic grave art, this dramatic life-size winged figure speaks more of the pain of those left behind by appearing collapsed, weeping, and draped over the tomb. This representation of great sorrow resonated across the ocean, and it has been replicated many times. I show you a few examples from various cemeteries around the United States. <clears throat> And a trip down the internet rabbit hole reveals that this angel has made its way into movies, onto album covers, and at the lower right, a commercial version that can be personalized to commemorate a loved one. Another effective work of cemetery art is the Adams Memorial by French's contemporary, Augustus St. Gaudens. 
located in Rock Creek Cemetery in Washington, DC. The memorial was commissioned by the author Henry Adams to memorialize his wife, Clover, who had committed suicide. Here we see a figure that conveys the great mystery of death, as well as beauty and wonder. Adams was interested in Eastern religions and the shrouded figure recalls enigmatic Buddhas and the foreign world. This is a good moment to mention that opening at the end of this month is a traveling exhibition focusing on Augusta St. Gaudens and Daniel Chester French, organized by the American Federation of Arts, Chesterwood and the St. Gaudens National Historical Park in Cornish, New Hampshire. The exhibition features works by the sculptors from the collections of these two historic sites and the full-size plaster model of the Adams Memorial will be included in this exhibition. The first venue is the Jewel Collins Smith Museum at Auburn University in Alabama, and then it will travel to other museums for the next two years. The catalog is available through Chesterwood's website, and the itinerary for the exhibition can be found on the American Federation of Arts website. Like his contemporary, St. Gaudens, French was also inspired by the profound mystery of death, and he created memorials of great beauty. One of my favorites is the Kinsley Hutchinson Memorial in Woodlawn Cemetery. Here, an angel possessing unearthly beauty and grace stops briefly to rest her hand upon a coffin. <clears throat> she is only momentarily alit here, and her gaze is directed outward. Her realistic wings look as if they could carry her off. To give you an idea of just how good a sculptor French was, here's a replica of the Kinsley Memorial by Italian sculptor James Novelli. Mary Glover Thurman's nephew commissioned Novelli specifically to carve a replica of the Kinsley Memorial. While technically proficient, Novelli's angel seems wooden and inanimate, her wings stiff and formulaic, and her expression bland. Sometimes it's difficult to truly comprehend French's mastery until you make a comparison with a lesser imitation. Let me take a moment to back up a bit and give you some background about French. He was born in 1850, the fourth child of Anne Richardson French and Henry Flagg French, a noted lawyer and judge in Exeter, New Hampshire. Old New England families, the French and Richardson ancestry goes back hundreds of years. French is pictured here at three years old, but just three years later, he was to have his very first encounter with death. His mother died when he was only six years old. His father remarried and the family moved about from Cambridge to Amherst, Massachusetts. In 1867, Henry Flagg French moved the family to Concord, <clears throat> a suburb of Boston, to a farmhouse on Sudbury Road. By now, French was a teenager and he enrolled at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, then located in Boston's Back Bay neighborhood, but left after freshman year. He worked on the farm, tending the strawberries and asparagus. Fascinated with nature, especially birds, French and his childhood friend, William Brewster, spent many afternoons traipsing through the Concord woods and marshes to track different species. French's detailed and illustrated bird book is now at the Chesterwood Archives at Chapin Library at Williams College. French and Brewster would keep up their friendship for the rest of their lives. About 10 years before the French family moved to Concord, the town's Sleepy Hollow Cemetery opened in 1855. Ralph Waldo Emerson, who would later be buried there, gave the dedication speech. He lauded the work of the landscape architects. The garden of the living, said Emerson, was as much for the benefit for the living to communicate the relationship to the natural world as it was to honor the dead. Sleepy Hollow Cemetery was a short walk from the French home. And many decades later, it would become French's final resting place. In the meantime, I imagine he spent many hours walking the shady meandering paths that seemed worlds away from the hustle of busy downtown Concord. One day, as the story goes, he was in the barn and spotted a turnip that was especially large and smooth. He saw a figure in it and whittled with his jackknife until a frog took shape under his hand. He showed it to his family at dinner and his father exclaimed, this looks like real talent. And his stepmother pronounced, Dan, there is your career. And I show you one of Sean Fields' wonderful drawings from the children's book, Monument Maker, by Concord writer, Linda Booth Sweeney. Concord in the 19th century was a hotbed of intellectualism and the birthplace of the transcendental movement that combined a respect for nature and self-sufficiency, 
a philosophy embraced by French and his family. They knew the Emersons as well as the Alcotts, and May Alcott, writer Louisa May Alcott's younger sister, was known as the artist of the community, having studied in Paris and shown work in the salon there. We don't know every detail about French and May Alcott's first consultation about sculpture, but we do know that French enrolled in her art classes and she gave him one of his first sculpting tools. He treasured it and it is now displayed in the barn gallery at Chesterwood. Alcott insisted that a sculptor had to first learn how to draw, so French also took drawing classes. Uh, he studied in Boston with artists William Rimmer and William Morris Hunt. He then spent a winter in New York learning sculpture techniques in the studio of John Quincy Adams Ward, then considered one of the best sculptors in the country. Returning home from New York with his new expertise, French crafted small tabletop figurines of animals and made portraits of his family and friends. He learned that Concord town father Ebenezer Hubbard had died leaving $1,000 for a memorial to the Minutemen who fought in the Battle of Lexington and Concord, the first battle of the Revolutionary War. To commemorate the upcoming centennial of the shot heard around the world, the town held a sort of competition, although it was quite certain French would be granted the commission. He created a few small maquettes, little 12 inch high sketches and showed them to his family. Here's another charming illustration from Linda Booth Sweeney's um, monument maker, children's biography of Daniel Chester French um, by Sean Fields. He picked the best one to submit, which the committee quickly approved. French wrote to his brother, of course, I have never made a statue. I wonder whether I can do it. This time next year, I shall know. When he was done with the final clay model, he cast it into plaster and then sent it on to the Ames Manufacturing Company in Chicopee, Massachusetts to be cast into bronze. The metal came from melted down cannons captured from the Confederate army during the Civil War. But French was not there to see his work set up on a pedestal. He had taken up a friend's invitation to live and work in Italy and would miss the unveiling scheduled for April 18, 1875. It is possible he was nervous about the work's reception and he couldn't bear to witness the crowd's reaction. For the rest of his career, French would avoid dedications and unveilings and he always shied away from any sort of public speaking. He insisted that his sculptures spoke for themselves. French spent about two years in Florence, Italy, where he lived with the family of American sculptor Hiram Powers, sculptor of the infamous Greek slave, which I show you at the left, which had shocked audiences throughout the United States when it toured in the 1840s. French traveled to Rome, Naples, and Pompeii, learned about armatures, plaster casting, and marble cutting, and was fully immersed in the classical tradition, along with other American sculptors who were reinterpreting ancient and Renaissance art. He visited the studios of other American sculptors such as Harriet Hosmer and William Wetmore Story. Along with hard work, French had some fun in Florence. He hung out with fellow Americans, attended parties and dances, played charades and croquet, sketched in museums and churches, <clears throat> and walked the length of the city. At the, um, at the left is French with his friend Hiram Powers' son, Ned, reinterpreting the cherubs from Raphael's Sistine Madonna, 1512, very famous Renaissance painting. When French returned from Florence, his father, who was then secretary of the treasury, was able to secure government commissions for sculpture, as well as a studio for his son to work in. These commissions included allegorical groups for government buildings, such as post offices and courthouses in St. Louis, Philadelphia, and Boston. French also rented a studio in Boston before building a new studio of his own next to the French family home in Concord. Here's the old Boston post office building with French's sculptural groups located on either side of that central tower. I wonder if passersby at ground level had any hope of making them out. And in this previous photo, I show you the two um, Boston post office groups. And you can see them um, up at the, at the top flanking that central tower. Here's a closer look. The post office building was raised in the late 1920s and the works moved to Franklin Park in 1930. It is now much easier to view the two allegorical groups, labor supporting the arts and domestic life, 
and the forces of steam and electricity subdued and controlled by science. Ideological representations of the region's capitalism, according to historian Richard Heath, who has contributed so much to the scholarship of French's works in Jamaica Plain. I am grateful for his careful research and for making his findings on these works and so many others available through the Jamaica Plain Historical Society website. The government commissions facilitated by his father enabled French to make a reputation for himself and commissions for portraits, monuments and memorials began to come his way. He forged connections with city planners, art schools and societies, architects, art commissions and individual patrons. Well connected now in the art world, he was busy with commissions year round. One of his most successful works, the Millmore Memorial, is from French's early career. It is astounding to me that he created such a masterful representation so early on. He would come back to the shrouded enigmatic figure over and over, and he continued to redefine what an angel could look like and represent. He would continue to incorporate gesture, movement, as well as personality and agency into his memorial figures. Around 1889, French had been commissioned to create a memorial to the sculptor Martin Milmore, also commemorating his brothers Joseph and James. Martin Milmore had died in 1883, just shy of his 40th birthday. He was best known for the Bigelow Memorial in Mount Auburn Cemetery, established in 1831 with a most ambitious vision. Within a forested landscape nestled between Cambridge and Watertown, the founders of the cemetery created an extraordinary place one where the living mourner would come to find solace and the public would come to find inspiration. According to information on the Mount Auburn Cemetery website, in March 1865, Bigelow first proposed that the cemetery commission a public monument in memory of the heroes who had fallen in the present war for the preservation of the Union. Bigelow wanted something more ambitious and symbolic than another obelisk and commissioned the Irish-born sculptor Martin Milmore to create a sphinx, which represented the strength of the lion and the beauty of woman. French's first model for the Milmore Memorial, which is at the right, shows that rather than incorporate realistic portraits of the brothers, he would instead create an allegorical scene in high relief. I wonder if French may have known the work on the left a relief for the tomb of the actor Philibert Rivière in Montmartre Cemetery in Paris by the French sculptor Auguste Préau. It's a highly possible French could have seen this relief in Paris where he spent time in the 1880s. There are many similarities between the two. An enigmatic robed figure seen in profile at the left halts the action of a young man at the right. Hamlet in the case of the Préau and the sculptor in French's version. In October, 1890, French wrote to his close friend, the ornithologist William Brewster. Now I write on a matter where our pursuits join hands. I have this winter to model an angel and it occurred to me the other day that you might help me in the study of wings. Can't you without much trouble get me a lot of them? I should like a half dozen pairs or so of different kinds and sizes, not with a view to copying any one particular specimen, but for the purpose of studying up on the subject. They would serve my purpose best dried just as they naturally close. Brewster did indeed send wings to French and the set has been preserved in the Stockbridge Library, not far from Chesterwood. French was also close to the American painter, Abbott Henderson Thayer, who was equally interested in nature. He even devised camouflage for the US Armed Forces based on birds and other animals who could conceal themselves in natural setting. Thayer's many paintings of angels are notable for his ability to lift his figures out of the commonplace and elevate them to an ethereal, exalted atmosphere beyond mere Christian iconography. And those wings on this um, figure are just magnificent. French was also familiar with French sculptor, such as Antoine Pierre Mercier. The wings of the angel in his Gloria Victus, which I show you at the right, set the figure in motion. They add a sense of the supernatural and indicate that the group is allegorical, expressing an abstract idea. In this photo of French's New York studio, you can see the Millmore in progress. 
To the left of the model, almost at the center of the photo, is French's lay figure, a posable jointed mannequin. She is positioned in the stance of the angel of death. French most likely worked from live models too, but the lay figure cut down on the amount of time he needed a live model to pose. And here at the left, you can clearly see French's working methods. He would model the full-size figures first in the nude and then apply the clothing. I particularly like in this photo um, how French's stance echoes that of the young sculptor. At the right is the 1865 painting, Young Painter Painting a Greek Mask by Jules Joseph Lefebvre, which French might have known as Lefebvre taught at the Académie Julienne in Paris, an art school popular with Americans studying abroad. Lefebvre only lightly draped his young artist, while French added much more clothing, an artist apron, tight leggings, and soft slippers to the young sculptor's wiry yet muscular frame. At some point, St. Gaudin saw French's model in the studio. Ecstatic, French wrote to his brother in February 1891, St. Gaudin's made me quite happy the other evening here by praising my Milmore angel enthusiastically. And finally, or as we um, see the work coming together, this color postcard and the next photo show the second version of the setting and architectural surround of the memorial two decades after its original unveiling in Forest Hill Cemetery. This second setting with its heavy cornice and scroll ornament was ordered by Oscar Milmore, the son of Joseph Milmore, and was across from Milmore's Roxbury Soldiers Monument. I haven't been able to find a photo of the very first setting, but contemporary descriptions indicate that it was quite plain and lacked a complementary architectural surround. And the work was moved again in 1945, close to the entrance of the cemetery, with a new architectural setting designed by the Boston firm Andrews, Jones, Bosco, and Whitmore. The Millmore Memorial, oopsies, with its pictorial quality of high relief, symbolic elements, overarching gestures, and rootedness in the real world, while invoking the divine, has inspired poetry and music. In front of the memorial is Pepita Millmore's poem that begins, Come, stay your hand, death to the sculptor cried, those who are sleeping have not really died. Composer George W. Chadwick wrote a symphonic poem titled Angel of Death. <clears throat> Chadwick explained to French, you may remember that when we stood before your relief of death and the sculpture, I told you that it meant music to me. The idea grew in my mind until last summer it developed into a symphonic poem, which is to be played by the New York Symphony Orchestra next Sunday. Not only did the Milmore Memorial inspire poetry and music, but Charles Niehaus, a contemporary of French, transposed the design into a World War I memorial for Des Moines, Iowa. Niehaus reversed the positioning of the two figures and the young soldier holds accoutrement of war and battle. In low relief, a large book is set upon an altar in the back. And in this detail, you can see that the angel of death, um, now at the right, inscribes the soldier's name in the book of the war dead. Viewing the two side by side, you can see just how indebted Niehaus was to French's Millmore Memorial. Even his angel's full length wings dip and curl as you see in French's work. So I leave it up to you, the viewer, to decide who sculpted it better and who wore it better. In 1921, French contracted with the Picciarelli brothers marble carvers with the studio in the Bronx who had carved many of French's monuments and memorials in the intervening years, including the iconic seated Abraham Lincoln for the Lincoln Memorial, uh, to carve a marble version of death and the sculpture for the Metropolitan Museum's collection of American sculpture. French was a trustee of the museum and the de facto sculpture curator. He advocated adding to the museum's collection sculpture created by living artists, much of the sculpture that you see when you visit the museum today was acquired during his tenure. He also generously donated this marble, as well as a marble replica of the Melvin Memorial, which um, I'll show you in a moment, both of which can be seen in the beautiful American Wing Courtyard. <clears throat> in 
1891, while still working on the mill moor, French and his family went up to Cornish, New Hampshire, where they rented a farmhouse and French worked in the studio of his friend and contemporary, Augusta St. Gaudens. While there, French employed a local young boy to pose for his statue of Adalbert Thayer Alden, which is in the Forest Hill Cemetery, and I show you at the left. French wrote to his brother towards the end of the summer, I am making a statue of a little boy who died last year, Alden of Boston, six years old, little Lord Fauntleroy costume. It is nearly done and is well thought of by the people here. It is to be in bronze. Although French enjoyed his time away from the hubbub of New York, he didn't relish being part of the large art colony that was growing um, in Cornish. But it's very possible the seed of an idea took hold that summer. For soon after, he and his wife started looking around Connecticut and Western Massachusetts for a country home of his own. French found his country retreat in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. He and his wife purchased a farm with a view of Monument Mountain. And this view echoed the view of a Mount of Scutney that he had admired at Cornish. French hired his friend, architect Henry Bacon, to design and construct a studio, boasting 29 foot high ceilings, north facing skylights, and a railroad track that enabled French to push his works out into the daylight, studio was purpose built for sculpture. French divided his time between New York and Stockbridge, spending the summer months in the Berkshires, not only working in the studio, but also puttering in the garden, walking around the woodland paths and entertaining family and friends from near and far. French used his own daughter, Margaret, who had been born in 1889, as a model for another work for Forest Hill Cemetery, the Clark Memorial. At right is a pastel portrait of Margaret by French. He was actually a very accomplished portraitist in oil and pastel, and Chesterwood has a number of painted portraits that we rotate in the studio. Visitors are often quite surprised to learn that he was just as talented with a paintbrush as he was with modeling clay. In April, 1894, French wrote to his sister Harriet, I am making two angels in relief for a gravestone in Forest Hills. Margaret has posed for them both more or less, and one of them looks a good deal like her. At top left is the other angel from the Clark Memorial, equally as charming, yet he has differentiated the child's features so that the two seem to be completely different individuals. French would have known Italian Renaissance works, such as this glazed terracotta by Luca della Robbia that I show you at the bottom. Yet French eschewed any overt religious imagery such as a Madonna and child and focused on what were ancillary figures in re Renaissance sculpture elevating the kneeling angel to the sole subject of the composition. This photo shows the memorial's unusual elongated shape. Cut in long low relief, it is set overlooking a small hill. The length and setting are quite striking and I was thrilled to have the chance to see it in person a couple of weeks ago. And, um, and this is actually my photo. To me, it seems to be one of French's works that is often overlooked, but is certainly one of his most poetic monuments and the angels have a serenity that is quite stunning. In 1898, French wrote to his sister Harriet, in the studio, I am just finishing a statue of an angel for a Mr. White in Boston to preside over his lot in Forest Hill Cemetery, a figure seven feet high with wings extended above the head. Installed in 1905, this angel stands like a majestic sentinel guarding the memory of Boston benefactor, George Robert White and his family. Larger than life, hands clasped, she is classically draped and her robust outstretched wings imply strength and gravitas. <clears throat> and um, I had the joy of seeing this work in person as well. And I took a number of um, photographs here, her hands and her toes. And um, I had fun using the wide angle lens on my camera. George Robert White had made his fortune in soap and created a fund to be used for creating works of public utility and beauty for the use and enjoyment of the inhabitants of the city of Boston. He was a trustee of the Museum of Fine Arts and Forest Hill Cemetery, and he died in 1922. After White's death, French was commissioned to design another work in his honor the appropriately titled Spirit of Giving, 
for the Boston Public Garden. The Slocum Memorial in Forest Hills was made by French's only female student and assistant, Evelyn Beatrice Longman. The two shared a very close personal and professional relationship. Longman had studied with sculptor Laredo Taft in Chicago. Taft actively promoted female sculptors and recognized Longman's talent. She arrived in New York with letters of introduction and made her way to French's studio. And she began by doing lettering for his Boston Public Library bronze doors and then stayed on to do much more. French was receiving so many commissions in the first decade of the 20th century that he wasn't able to execute them all. Instead, he passed along commissions to his students, assistants, and his protege, Evelyn Beatrice Long. French had recently completed Morning Victory for the Melvin Memorial in Sleepy Hollow Cemetery in Concord. Finding success with this design of a larger than life draped figure carved into deep relief and seemingly emerging from a block of granite, French and Longman adapted the format for the Slocum Memorial for Forest Hills. And um, the Slocum Memorial commemorates the life of William Slocum, who lived on an estate in Jamaica Plain. To his sister, French wrote in 1909, Miss Longman has been making a life-size figure in relief for my design for an angel in Forest Hill Cemetery. I am to go over it and put my impress on it presently. It is the angel of the darker drink. French felt that the gloomy, sad, hopeless view of death had been dwelt upon so much in art, almost to the exclusion of the sweeter aspects of it. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Uh, and he wrote um, to his sister, some Greek 2000 years ago said, what is so beautiful that it ought to be true that men may be content to live the gods have hidden from them that it is sweet to die. I should like my angel to reveal this truth. Longman worked on the Slocum and it is interesting to see some of her other works that are quite similar in design. The Laurel Gamble Thompson and the Story Memorials both also feature heavily draped mysterious figures. It's also interesting, I think, to see the comparison between St. Gaudens' Adams Memorial, which I showed earlier and is at left, and, the, and Longman's Story Memorial. Both seem to imply not only mystery, but the eternal silence of death and mortality. I just want to touch on some works beyond Forest Hills. Not far from here, by near Jamaica Pond, is French's Parkman Memorial which commemorates the life of historian Francis Parkman, author of books and essays focusing on histories of contact between Native Americans and Anglo-European settlers. It turns out he's a bit of a tricky figure when his writings and beliefs are examined through today's lenses. Parkman had no faith in the equality of men and believed that women should keep in their places. And he made many anti-abolitionist comments, such as, I would see every slave knocked on the head before I would see the union go to pieces, and I would include in the sacrifice as many abolitionists as could conveniently be brought together. His engagement with Native American histories is also fraught, and he knowingly downplayed and suppressed records of Native American acts of sovereignty and diplomacy. Chesterwood recently received a National Endowment of the Humanities grant for a scholar to examine and reinterpret works by French that may be seen as controversial today. Professor Emily Burns is about to launch an online exhibition that will be accessible via Chesterwood's website. And this exhibition re-examines the Parkman Memorial, as well as French's Four Continents for the United States Custom House in New York City, the Lincoln Memorial, and other works. I hope you will take the time to view the exhibition, which should be available later this spring. The process of designing the Parkman Memorial took almost 10 years and two architects. This is the first model, which is now lost and only exists in this photograph. You can see two figures carved in deep relief, a, a Native American man and a woman on each pier with a profile portrait of Parkman at the top. French wasn't happy with this model and the architect, Charles McKim, called the figures stumpy and wilted. So he went back to the drawing board and this is the second model. The second model features a more gentle exedra between the two piers 
and the figures underwent changes as well. French carved them um, in a much more shallow relief. And by then a new architect, Henry Bacon, came on the project. And although this model was accepted by the Boston Art Commission, it was not built according to this design. Um, and these are the two figures that were um, carved in, this, in the first model and French um, made larger full-size versions of them in plaster. And they are now installed on the piazza of uh, French's studio at Chesterwood. And you can sort of see them there in that photograph. And this is the third model, which features just one single figure of a Native American. French explained that the Indian does not represent any particular chief, but only one of the five nations in the costume of the Iroquois, about which Parkman wrote so much. Um, interestingly, this model is a little bit more sketchy than many of French's other preparatory works, but um, I think it certainly still gives the idea of his general design. And um, this historical photograph shows the final work in situ. And I just love the moody lighting um, and the bare trees and this um, interesting stark angle that gives the work um, certainly a, a great sense of imperiousness. For more detailed information about this memorial, I do suggest taking a look at Richard Heath's essay on the Jamaica Plain Historical Society website. He's done some great research into the history of the Parkmen and includes some other interesting historical photographs. And finally, um, I will just show you um, a handful of French's other stunning cemetery memorials. <clears throat> And I, I think you'll agree that he was a master of creating benevolent angels and stunning allegorical figures that harmonize with landscapes and other works in rural cemeteries. His daughter Margaret posed for the young angel for the um, Chapman Memorial, which is in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, and I show you at left the Rutherford Stuyvesant Memorial in New Jersey and the first design um, for this memorial at Wright that was not accepted by the client, um, Rutherford Stuyvesant's wife. French's letter to her expresses not only his thoughts regarding the commission, but also um, he talks about angels, death, and the afterlife in general. He wrote, I perfectly understand that you wish this memorial to express not despair or even utter grief, but hope and faith in the life to come. I have no patience with the grim representation of the angel of death as usually portrayed because it seems to me in direct opposition to the teachings of the Christian religion and partly because even if there were no hope of a future life, it seems to me the province of the artist to soothe, not to increase the pain that is inevitable. My own interpretation of the design is that the figure represents the angel of death closing the door of the tomb. And he is talking about this, his first design, which is it right. So far, your understanding of it and my intentions are identical, but I hope to be able to make the action so gentle in the expression of the face, as well as of the figure so benign that it would not convey any idea of hopelessness or even of intense sorrow. In the end, French and his client agreed upon the more majestic winged figure that you see it left. Um, however, French felt so strongly about his first design that he um, adapted it for a grave marker for um, his cousins, um, his Russell cousins in Greenfield, Massachusetts. For memory, an allegorical figure for the Marshall Field Memorial for Chicago, French hired his friend, the actress and model Mary Lawton, who had also proposed, posed for Alma Mater and other works. She sat for him in the Chesterwood studio and a series of photographs document this modeling session. And here's the final work in situ. So here's the model posing and she's looking into a small mirror. And here's the final work in Chicago. Um, and the Jesse Parker Williams Memorial. It is possible this photograph at right shows model Hetty Anderson posing for this memorial to an Atlanta railroad magnate who had also fought 
for the Confederacy during the Civil War. This is the only one, this is only one of two works that French made commemorating figures who had fought for the Confederacy. These cemetery memorials exemplify French's career, his reverence for beauty and the loftier issues of his craft. Sculpture for French was personal and metaphysical. He thought deeply about representation, allegory, and symbolism, often departing from Christian iconography. He poured every ounce of emotion and feeling that he could muster into his work, whether it commemorated a great president, a historian, merchant, or soldier, Union or Confederate. French passed away in October 1931. His daughter, Margaret, also a sculptor, designed his grave marker in Sleepy Hollow Cemetery, which is adorned with a carving of a wreath and sculpture tools. After a career that had spanned more than 50 decades, death had finally stayed the hand of the sculptor. Margaret French Crescent inherited the studio and the residence and dedicated her life to preserving the legacy of her father. She wrote a biography titled Journey into Fame, amassed a collection of her father's work and created a museum at Chesterwood, which opened to the public in 1955. In 1969, she transferred the site to the National Trust for Historic Preservation, which owns and operates Chesterwood today. It is thanks to Margaret's foresight and energy that French's works, studio and gardens were preserved. I invite you to visit Chesterwood this season. We are busy preparing the site, which opens in late May. We will be hosting artists in residence, the 45th annual Contemporary Sculpture Show, and a roster of arts events, including poetry readings and dance performances um, are all in the works for this coming season. Please come see the studio where French labored during the summer months and our exhibitions and installations highlighting his sculpture career. I hope to see you at Chesterwood this season. Thank you very much.